Zudi, uh, the Minister of Climate Change and Environment of UAE. Uh, he got his uh, master's degree, MSc, in project management from British, man, uh, British University in Dubai, and uh, also a very unique person who got another master's degree along with it in business administration, which is from the New York Institute of Technology. And uh, he got his bachelor's degree in petroleum engineering from University of Tulsa. Uh, he was appointed as the uh, Climate Change and Environment Minister of UAE on February uh, 2016. Onwards is uh, having tremendous plans uh, to implement and protect the unique uh, uh, eco-climate ecosystem of UAE. Uh, as you know, the UAE has uh, given utmost importance to environmental issues and spending millions of uh, dirhams uh, for planting trees and protecting the uh, environment. So he is the responsible person of uh, such activities in UAE and uh, uh, his forefathers and the very respectable personality of the world uh, and uh, the former president of U UAE, Sheikh Zayed, also had given much importance the, to the environment. So the same policy adopting and uh, following by our excellence uh, Thani Al Zuyudi and uh, we are very happy to welcome him to this uh, fest and uh, for this program also. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's indeed a pleasure to join you all in the stunning city of Calcutt for the Kerala Literature Festival 2020. This edition focuses on a subject that has been dominating the news lately, climate change. I am truly grateful for the organizers for choosing this theme for the current edition of, to highlight the deepening climate crisis the world is facing nowadays. The UAE and India share a strong sense of respon respons responsibilities toward the environment. They are firm advocates of climate action and sustainability. India's renewable energy journey has been truly impressive with the country pledging to generate 40% of its power from carbon free sources by 2030 as part of its commitment toward the climate change of Paris Agreement. On the sidelines of the landmark COP21, India and France joined hands to launch the International Solar Alliance that the UAE is also a part of. The alliance has since emerged as a credible platform for ensuring universal energy access and energy equity. According to the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, India ranks fourth worldwide for the installed solar and wind power capacity. The fact that overall electricity generation may triple over the next 20 years is more good news for India's clean energy sector. Government support and enabling regulations are set to strengthen India's status as a global clean energy power house in the years to come. Ladies and gentlemen, and now allow me to share with you some of the key milestones of the UAE's journey toward the climate resilience future. As many of you probably know, the founding father of the UAE, late Sheikh Zayed bin Sultan Al Hayyan, was a will known humanitarian and passionate advocates for sustainable development and building our nation. He was careful to maintain the delicate balance between man and the environment to allow them both to thrive. I want to go back a bit in the history. And in 1972, about six months after the formation of the UAE, delegation 
from the new country and attended the United Nations Conference on Human Environment, the world's first environmental mega conference. The late Sheikh Zayed met with the members of the delegations just before they embarked on their journey and told them clearly that while they were heading to Sweden as representatives of the UAE's population, he expected them to speak for all the people of the world. Strong message from a leader just a few months after the establishment and announcement of the nation. Over the course of nearly five decades, our population has surged from some 275,000 in 1971, the year of the country's formation, to around 9.5 million in 2019. To accommodate the increase in numbers, we developed a wide network for roads, of roads for the 3.4 million cars of the, on the streets today. While the UAE once had two airports, today visitors to the UAE can fly out of seven international airports. And as a maritime nation, the country is now home to 20 seaports, including one of the top world's ports. Our achievements has, have not been limited to planet Earth. Last year, in 2019, the UAE sent the first Emirati astronaut to space. And this year, we are set to, to make history again with the probe mission to Mars. Distinguished guests, the UAE's progress has no doubt been remarkable, but has put the country's scarce natural resources under great pressure. To achieve balance, we adopted a holistic approach that would ensure sustainability across all sectors. And despite its location in the heart of a region known for its hydrocarbon and dependence on hydrocarbon, the UAE has realized early on that energy diversification is the key to cutting down greenhouse gases and to ensuring that our climate action efforts are on track. We set ambitious clean energy targets, 27% by 2021 and 50% by 2050. We deployed mega renewable energy projects to meet those targets, including the 5 gigawatt Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum Solar Park set to be fully operational in 2030. The latest addition to the list is the 1.17 gigawatt Noor Abu Dhabi, the world's largest single site solar power plant, consists of 3.2 million solar panels that started commercial operation in June 2019. We also announced a new 2 gigawatt solar project that is already in the works. We have launched renewable energy projects valued at 14 billion US dollar and totaling almost 12 gigawatts in the UAE and in 25 countries around the world. Nationally, we have grown our renewable energy portfolio by over 400% in the last 10 years, and we are well on track to double it again in the upcoming 10 years. And to complement our clean energy, portfolio this year were set to become the first country in the region to deliver safe, commercial, and peaceful nuclear power. Once fully operational, the Baraka nuclear energy plant will supply up to 25% of the UAE's electricity needs. Another way of producing power, waste to energy, which we consider as a promising clean energy option that we, will, uh, we are taking seriously to explore. This year, three major waste to energy plants will contribute to the grid and divert a huge amount of waste away from going to the landfills. We also have a national target to improve our energy efficiency by 40% by 2050. And due to our hot and arid climate, we spend a huge amount of electricity on cooling. Our strategy tackles energy efficiency in supplying as well as well as the news. And in this context, we have widely deployed district cooling systems that reduce the amount of energy used for cooling by around 
Ladies and gentlemen, determined to cut down its carbon footprint, the UAE has de developed and deployed carbon capture, utilization, and storage systems and technologies in our conventional energy space as well. Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, ADNOC, has implemented a project to, sec sec to reduce CO2 from its own operations that nets 800,000 of CO2 a year using second and third generation carbon capture technologies. ADNOC aims to increase its carbon capture utilization and storage program by 500% by 2030, capturing the same amount of CO2 as 5 million acres of forest. Distinguished guests, biodiversity loss and ecosystem degradations are among the most disturbing effects of climate change. Sadly, scientists have found that around 1 million species may be pushed to extensions in the next few years. The loss of even the smallest species can lead to the destabilizations of the world's ecosystems. That's why in the UAE we have long been committed to preserving local biodiversity and are continuing expanding our protected area. We also have a proven track record of developing and implementing effective conservation initiatives to protect endangered species. For centuries, the Arabian oryx had roamed remote areas around the world in large herds, but overhunting and habitat loss contributed to a steep decline in its numbers. In 2000, the UNCN IUC and Red List of Threatened Species declared that the Arabian oryx extends in the wild. It seemed that another graceful creature was lost to the, to the world, and urgent action was needed to guarantee the survival of the Arabian oryx. We had the last five to seven of these in the wild captured to form the basis of a breeding program that saved the entire species from extinction. At present, the Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Arabian Oryx reintroduction program released hundreds, hundreds of animals into protected area every year. We succeeded in bringing the beautiful animal back from the brink of extension. And I'm pleased to share with you today that the UAE is home to 7,500 of these stunning creatures. Another notable example of the UAE's conservation efforts is the Afri African Oryx. We joined forces with the government of Chad to reintroduce the African Oryx into the Central Africa, African country. And so far, 200 animals were transported from Abu Dhabi and released into the wild, a historic milestone. The country is also leading major efforts in saving multiple other endangered species. The dugong, or sea cow, is one of the most unusual members of the marine world. Endeavors to save the declining global population of dugong took root in Abu Dhabi as early as 1976. Fishermen were banned from killing sea cows. Efforts to protect the shy mammal have continued with the UAE hosting the Secretariat task with implementing the multilateral Dogong MOU and the inception of Mohammed bin Zayed Species Conservation Fund, the agency responsible for the Dogong and sea grasses conservation project. Today, the UAE's rich blue water are home to the second largest Dogong population in the world after Australia. Our conservation efforts extended to the skies. The falcon, the national bird of the UAE, has been the focus of our conservation efforts for years. Owing to the Sheikh Zayed Falcon Release Program, around 2,000 falcons have made their ways back to the wild since 1995. We also established the Abu Dhabi Falcon Hospital, the world's largest hospital dedicated to the falcon and a leader in avian medicine. The award-winning specialist facility cares for more than 10,500 falcons on average every year. Ladies and gentlemen, our commitment to safeguarding biodiversity have been steadfast, and the threat of climate change has one made us more determined to win this fight. Climate change is a living nightmare faced by every country and region in the world. 
some more than the others. It is fight that every nation must overcome. However, to succeed in our mission, we need to actively involve everyone, governments, businesses, academia, and the public. Climate change knows no boundaries, and nor should our efforts in tackling it. In closing, I thank you all for joining us today. Do remember, governments cannot act alone. Real change takes place only when we all work together. I wish Kerala Literature Visitable 2020 great success and hope you all enjoy productive debates, discussion, and interactions that burden minds and enrich your knowledge. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. Uh, you have just listened to a short yet profound exposition of the of the kind of edge at which human species is standing now. We are, and we have been warned again and again by scientists on the brink of a disaster, which is almost a kind of suicide, because mankind has been behaving absolutely irresponsibly being irresponsible to himself or herself, being irresponsible to the animals around us and the trees and the nature around us. And it is, it is absolutely great to listen to someone who belongs in some sense to a desert country speaking about and uh, the, the greening of uh, the, the whole world, uh, the, the need for uh, greening the world, the, the need for a basic change in the approach to the questions of environment and the questions of climate change uh, at this juncture of extreme global warming and various other kinds of natural disasters which all seem to have been created, at least to, the, to a great extent, seem to have been created by man himself. So it is time for the human species to rethink uh, its priorities, to reimagine uh, the, uh, the earth no, uh, uh, to, to, to first uh, admit that this earth was not created only for human beings there are other species residing on it and if we ha happen to be the agents of the destruction of this planet uh, I think we are not going to be pardoned by either the animal world or the plant world or uh, whoever created the humankind. Uh, so uh, so uh, it has been an extremely well-informed lecture, and more than that, it, since the words come from an actual practitioner or, of environmental protection, I think the words have an added value, because it is, it is not just a sermon um, uh, done alone, I mean, uh, an intellectual sermon, but it comes from someone who has been practicing, who has been reading about, uh, environment and climate change, and someone who is actually engaged in uh, uh, in fighting this uh, 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 the kind of disaster that uh, seems to uh, uh, that that threatens to engulf us very soon. Uh, I would I would like uh, some of you to raise uh, your own doubts and questions about global warming and climate change, and how uh, uh, how can we um, who belong to India or who belong to at least Kerala. Uh, uh, help in changing our understanding of environment and changing our attitude towards the environment, which also means a change in our attitude towards development, because these questions are absolutely co uh, related to each other. The, the, how do we conceive uh, development? Do we conceive a kind of development which will lead to a, a total destruction of environment? Or do we want a development where environment is absolutely protected? Where, the, where development is sustainable and it actually reaches uh, uh, the, the, the real people at the grassroots who should be the, the real beneficiaries of, uh, of, uh, of development in the real sense of the term. Uh, and we, uh, especially the people of Kerala, have gone through already two uh, fatal floods and immediately after the floods we have uh, uh, a season of drought and, and why, why do these things happen and what is the role 
of human beings in in the in these disasters these are questions we need to ask to ourselves and maybe we should also ask uh, our, our uh, scholar to uh, uh, questions about the environment questions about uh, um, uh, about climate change I, I i call him a scholar because he's much more than a minister uh, so, uh, so I, I i i would i would like you to uh, raise questions if you have any uh, uh, regarding um, the topic that he has uh, uh, he has uh, dealt with uh, at some length thank you very much for this exciting and interesting presentation uh, my question actually uh, about the the principles and teachings of climate change how the government of uae uh, practice this uh, policy or how do you implement the policy through generations is there any uh, curriculum planning or syllabus planning for students in educational department in uh, collaboration with uh, your ministry انا اريد من سعادتك باول التوضيح والتوجيهات كيف حكومه دوله الامارات تحاول تطبيق هذه السياسات والاستراتيجيات كلها تتعلق بالتغير المناخي في بتعاون مع وزاره التربيه والتعليم في المدارس والمعاهد التعليميه والجامعات فليتفضل thank you thank you it's uh, it's one of the uh, question which we keep uh, uh, getting wherever we go absolutely we, we there is an engagement between us and ministry of uh, education and the uh, integrating most of environmental and climate work within the curriculum that we have within the UAE we don't have a dedicated uh, uh, subject for the climate change environment it has been embedded in a couple of subjects within within the the uh, curriculum that we have uh, uh, within the, 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 the that is provided to the students and we're doing it in different stages to the different uh, uh, 12 years uh, of education so we already have that uh, within the curriculum and we have special programs between the ministry of education and the environmental uh, entities where do we do take some of the students and focus on certain uh, 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 initiatives and work that we want them to pass across the distinguished thing which we did as well lately in the last few years we capitalize on social media and we know that is going to have a huge impact in a broader youth uh, generation and we saw the impact is growing dramatically from almost 40% four years ago to almost now 80% from the survey that we have conducted so it's not only the curriculum we're, we're even interacting directly with the youth something uh, as well which we did in the last two years we launched something called the emirates youth climate change strategy where youth are taken uh, from the beginning in the development of the policy some of the initiatives which they have initiated and they're responsible about the implementation and then we ensure that they participate with us wherever we go abroad for example in the last uh, cup in madrid just a month ago 75% of our delegation were youth below below 30 strong sending strong message that we have to practice what we preach thank you i noticed that you had a commitment to give 25% of the energy requirement through nuclear source how do you think solar energy would help uae and even india since it is a very so it's so very common and very available renewable energy which can be put into practice solar and renewables are part of our strategy for the clean energy and so really we have almost 7% of our energy comes out from uh, solar nowadays by 2050 the clean energy has to contribute by 50% by 2050 so it's already part of the of the uh, of the game if we're talking about the numbers 10 years ago we had 10 megawatt already connected to the grid last year 2019 we had 1800 megawatt already con connected to the grid from the solar pvs and there is a plan to to have another 
6,500 megawatts by 2030. So the solar is, is already part of the energy mix within the UAE, and I'm sure here in, the, in, in India, it's ranked as one of the, one of the top countries that has been capitalizing the, the solar uh, in the energy mix. Uh, as I mentioned in the, my remarks, we, the UAE is part of the International Solar Alliance, which has been initiated by the Prime Minister Modi 2015. And we're looking forward to continue this and explore how can we work together, not only here in, in India or in the UAE, even, even in a third, a third country uh, in, that, in that aspect. Thank you. Namaskarani, sir. I'm going to ask you a question about the sir. Sir, in the UAE, the role of artificial rain creating a cloud seeding project in the UAE. Is it safe or not safe? What is the role of UAE? Sir, it's about on the cloud seeding project, sir. Thank you so much. You know, we had very heavy rain in the last five days, and everyone was asking if it's normal or couch seeding. So uh, we had a storm in the whole region uh, in the last few days, which uh, uh, caused the snow in one of the neighbor countries in Saudi Arabia, and the storm was uh, coming toward the UAE. So it was a mix between both the nature as well as the cloud seeding uh, during, uh, during the, the last uh, few days. And we managed to harness a huge quantity, a huge volume of rainfall during those period. How safe is it? Absolutely safe, because first of all, we're not, we're not using any non-environment material uh, within the cloud seeding. So most of the stuff, which materials that we're using are basically are electrical charges to the, to the clouds. So from environmental point of view, we're not releasing any harmful elements to the, to the clouds. Second thing, we reach, we reach the optimum uh, dose of those electrical charges when we, when we start the cloud seeding. So the consequences which we see on the, on the, uh, 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 after the rainfall is fall in our area is absolutely positive because it's recharged some of the underground water, it's filled the dams, and it has a huge impact on the ecological system within the UAE. So there is no harm so far, uh, and we're continuing our research and development. It's a program which we started five years ago under the leadership of His Highness Sheikh Mansour bin Zayed, the uh, chairman of the Meteorology Center, uh, and we're going to continue exploring what are the best technology and research on that aspect. Thank you. Good evening, sir. See, in the case of climate change, we can see that uh, management of waste is an issue. Everywhere in the world, especially now e-waste, including all kinds of wastes. So how do you deal with this waste management in UAE? And what are the new methods? Uh, can you address with the Kerala situation? And we are suffering with that also. Thank you. Waste sector is something which we know it's, uh, it's uh, an issue uh, that is growing in the whole region and globally, especially that we have to come up with the solutions to get rid of the waste as much as we can and as quickly as, uh, as possible because dumping it into the landfills means we're creating another environmental issue. We have very tough targets to be achieved by 2021, by next year, which is uh, recycling almost the 75% of our solid waste uh, uh, that is dumped now to the landfill. We started with a couple of projects in the last two years. One of them, Waste to Energy. It's a technology which has been applied for the, for the first time in the whole region. But we have to start doing it because uh, it's one of the technologies which is going to have a major reduction on the waste that goes to the landfill. And we talked some of the experience from Singapore, some of the experience from the Scandinavian countries on that aspect. The second project which we initiated as well, or started construction uh, last, earlier uh, last year in 2019, the RDF, how we're going to re-recycle re, uh, the, the waste and transform it to a coal which can be used in a cement factory. That, that, that project is going to be uh, uh, commissioned and uh, announced or inaugurated by September, September this year. So another, another step forward. We announced another two projects for waste to energy, one in Dubai, one of the largest waste to energy projects in Dubai. 
and that we were expecting the first line to be connected to the to the grid so we'll start producing power by january next year and abu dhabi is about to announce a new project as well because the tendering process has been initiated so uh, waste energy waste to biofuel something which we're considering but we're taking them uh, step by step we have to pilot it see what is going to be suits our environment and so suits our condition and then we'll take it to a larger scale here in uh, comparing the, the UAE and Kerala, we have this almost the same uh, same circumstances. So, waste energy is one of the main solutions which which, ha, which can reduce dramatically the, the the waste that goes to the landfill and even contributes uh, quickly to the power uh, shortage that is needed for such states. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's very impressive to see the efforts taken by the government. My question is related to waste as well, um, and um, it, it's related to how, what are the challenges your ministry has in dealing with other ministries that require consumption. Uh, I'd imagine your, your ministry is interested in creating less waste, whereas there are definitely other ministries that are uh, promoting consumption and, and therefore creating more waste. How do you deal with those challenges? Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. The, something, something which we, I have to send across. In the UAE, we work on synergy. So there is no conflicts between ministries. Uh, yes, we do. We want to reduce the waste, and some other ministries want to, to increase the production or the consumptions. But we, we always put in our, in our minds that there are some subsidies, subsidies from the governments. So reducing the consumption or reducing the production means that less subsidies from the government, so they're gaining as well. So we're looking at the bigger picture, not only from the direct revenue, but also on the macro level, where we, we have to reduce the pressure from the government subsidies and at the same time increase the, uh, the, gov the, the people, uh, consumers' behavior. I'll give you two simple examples. The, wa the first one is the water. We as a ministry, we want the reduction dramatically in water because we're scarce when it comes to water. A ministry of uh, electricity or uh, electri electricity authority wants to sell more water. But at the same time, they're subsidizing it. So what we did in the last three years, we increased the tariff of the water uh, in the UAE and reduced the subsidies from the governments. We saw a major transformation in the behavior of our, of our people when it comes to their reactions to the, uh, to the water. And at the same time, we reduce almost our bills from 14 uh, billion uh, uh, per year as subsidies to almost four to six billions. So the saving were much better than the revenue that we're, we're go we, we've been generating from selling directly the water. So that is the formula which we always look at, how we're going to reduce the subsidies and at the same time, change, put pressure on the ba people's behavior to change the reaction. The second one, the second uh, model which we have done is the, uh, the fuel, uh, the transportation fuel consumptions. We, in the last two years, we start linking the, uh, uh, the prices of uh, transportation fuel to the global, uh, uh, global market. Uh, it's not anymore subsidized. We have to push people to start thinking about more efficient vehicles uh, to, to carpooling uh, whenever they go to the, to the, uh, to the uh, work or wherever they, they want to move around and we see really a major transformation in the behaviors of, of people in that aspect. If you allow me to say something as well on waste, because the, the previous question was about the e-waste e, uh, as well and the other aspects. And the e-waste, we, we uh, inaugurated last year one of the largest e-waste factory in the whole uh, region where it has been led by one of the Indian uh, business people as well who is based in Dubai, uh, in close collaboration with some of the uh, local partners. Uh, so we're moving on the e-waste. We're, wo we're working as well on the plastic waste. Uh, we have uh, three mega plastic factories in the UAE, so we can push as well in the, uh, toward that uh, circular economy concept where plastic has to be transformed. So the efforts are already there. We as a government, we have the mega projects to ensure that we're, moving, uh, we're gonna move much faster, but also we have the support from the, the private sector who have been initi initiating good projects so we can all work together in that aspect.
there are no more questions. Uh, I think we could uh, just conclude the session. I would just like to remind all of us that India had a great environmentalist who never called himself an environmentalist and his name was Gandhi, whom we call the Mahatma. Perhaps he was uh, the first conscious uh, environmentalist that India ever produced uh, he, because he, of course, he, he was a deeply philosophical, uh, he had a philosophical approach to the whole question of environment <clears throat> because he believed that ultimately the destruction of environment comes from our uh, greed for consumption and only by reducing consumption for which you need to reduce your greed uh, can, can you ever uh, protect your environment and uh, create a, a new form of development which uh, does not uh, leave uh, much footprint, I mean human uh, footprint on earth and, and on, on, on nature. Uh, so uh, that is why he focused on the villages, on the on small scale production. And anybody who has read this uh, Hind Swaraj and many of his uh, other uh, writings in the in his famous magazine Harijan and other other kinds of uh, the journals would easily understand uh, that how how deep was his uh, grasp of this fundamental contradiction between. Uh, consum extreme consumption and the preservation of, of nature. Um, perhaps he was preceded by somebody like the Buddha. Uh, because he also spoke of the dangers of desire, extreme desire, which ultimately will prove self-destructive. And, and it is perhaps this greed for profit, uh, this uh, uh, cra crazy kind of consumption that we, uh, we are engaged in, that ultimately lead to uh, the destruction of the nature, of environment, and ultimately of the human humankind itself. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't think you have uh, uh, more questions. All of us might have more questions because the, the questions are coming up about in, in India also about uh, uh, the need to change our way, way, uh, attitude to development. Uh, questions of uh, plastic, for example, in this festival, we have seen to it that we don't use plastic. We have used glass bottles and we have avoided fluxes, uh, which, uh, which actually cost us a, a lot more. Yeah, yeah. Even the, in the, even the badges are cloth badges uh, because we, uh, we wanted, uh, wanted not only to speak about environment, but also to give a message through, through these little, little symbolic gestures, symbolic acts where you use a glass bottle instead of a plastic bottle or where you have a badge made of cloth rather than of, 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 of plastic. And we have avoided uh, flux boards, uh, which are quite common in Kerala. And there is now a ban generally on the flux boards. So gradually, perhaps we are also moving towards uh, that kind of an awareness about uh, the need to preserve our in environment, uh, which uh, is in our own interest as a species on Earth. Uh, if you don't have any, any further questions, I think we'll, we'll conclude. Shall we conclude? Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for your keen attention and the intelligent questions. Now.